It is a, a real pleasure to be able to speak to you today. It's such a pleasure that I'm going to jettison my usual spiel about frogs, pots of waters, and stoves. Uh, I believe you all have a copy of my, of my book, Waking the Frog, but I think it's a, an interesting enough opportunity. I would much rather talk about collaboration. And I mean something quite specific about collaboration. I'll get into that. Um, but look, we need each other. And when I say that, I mean, I'm speaking as a climate hawk and clean tech entrepreneur to the energy incumbents, right? Um, climate change affects all industries, it affects all regions, it affects all countries, it affects all people. And so this collaborative effort, I think, between energy incumbents and the emerging clean tech stars holds a lot of promise, but I'm not going to speak in generalities. Uh, I actually showed a preview copy of, one of my book to a, a CEO of a big oil and gas firm who shall remain unnamed. And he said, Tom, I'm really sick of hearing about the problem and solutions that are in general form. So I'm going to be quite specific about the kinds of solutions that I think exist, and I'm going to map them out in economic terms in what I hope is the language that an oil and gas uh, project manager would speak. Uh, but suffice to say, when I talk about collaboration, I don't mean tactical collaboration. I'll, de I'll define those two. One is short term, one is long term. And when I talk about resilience, I'm not just talking about a resilient economy but I'm talking about a resilient business strategy for the energy incumbents so that you will be an energy incumbent 50 years from now. You need us, we need you. Anybody who reads the business pages and keeps an eye on carbon counts understands that normally this kind of conversation is a source of conflict. There are a lot of barriers to having a real conversation. On one side, we need to power our economy. Right? And it takes a lot of power to keep this global economy going. There is demand for fossil fuels. There's no question about that. At the same time, if we continue to power our economy in the way that we do now, we will bring that economy to its knees. That's what's behind the polite language of the recent IPCC report. We will bring the economy. So there's a conflict there. There's a paradox there. When it comes to conversations between climate hawks and energy incumbents, it's us and them. It's clean versus dirty. And there's a lot of barriers to having a real conversation. We don't have time for it to be us and them anymore. We don't have time for it to be clean and dirty anymore. We need to figure out a way to open up a gap, to realize what the barriers are, and open up opportunity and collaboration. Because we will not solve this problem collectively without the energy incumbents. Your capital, your engineering, your access to global markets, your lobbying capacity, your ability to maintain the status quo if you so choose, has been shown. You can flex your muscles. Exxon's response to climate risk in their recent report when they responded to Climate Tracker was, I acknowledge climate risk, I acknowledge it's real. You know what? My social license is not going to disappear anytime soon. That's flexing muscles. <laughs> but rather than fight us, climate hawks and clean tech people, I think it's much more productive to figure out how to have that muscle work in our favor. Right? So I'm going to do, try to do a little Tai Chi on you here and try to show you that it's in your best interests, short and long term, to engage on solutions to this problem. And I'll show you those solutions that are quite specific. So the first kind of collaboration is we acknowledge we have a shared problem. That's done, right? Educated people accept the science. We have a shared problem. The second way in which we collaborate is one might work inside the fence to lower your own emissions. That's what COSIA is all about. The industry has gotten together, sharing best practices, sharing intellectual, tech, uh, uh, intellectual property, to figure out ways to lower emissions. That is another kind of collaboration. A third kind of collaboration is Alberta has stepped out ahead and has acknowledged that a price on carbon is appropriate. That's the CCMC. That's who's hosting this conference. I applaud all of these efforts, but I want to go one step further. The only point in putting a price on carbon is to reduce the amount of fossil fuels that you burn, ultimately. There is, if all it is, it's a penalty to continue with business as usual, it doesn't serve you well. It doesn't really serve us well. Maybe we get some projects financed, but at the end of the day, if we're not reducing the amount of fossil fuels we burn, then we're not doing the job the price on carbon is meant to do. Either by funding technologies to compete with fossil fuels, and why are we doing that? To compete with fossil fuels. Or we're raising the price of fossil fuels. Why? To allow the new entrants more room to maneuver in the market. So philosophically, it is, it is not the purpose of a price on carbon to continue with business as usual. Otherwise, it's a straw man. 
It's just something to distract everybody while we continue with business. So I will assume that the price on carbon is about transforming our energy economy. And the people who can benefit most from that are the energy incumbents, and I'll tell you why. So I'm not going to talk about generalities, about different kinds of energy that are out there. I've done this at length. I'm going to be quite specific. There are three technologies I'll, I'll get to in particular that are interesting ways to build low carbon energy assets, right? Just like you spend money to develop a new field, to find out what the resource looks like, to figure out the risks and so on, these are fields you can explore. They are low carbon assets. I call them clean fields. The argument I'm going to make to you is that even if all you do is dabble, these are a better deal. <laughs> they have better financial returns than developing a new oil and gas field. So there is a short-term interest to pursue in this long-term strategy, and they come together. So by clean field, I mean the ability to generate a set of assets with significant enterprise value that has significant energy output with a decent IRR with a lower carbon risk than a traditional field. Right? It's a new class of asset. But the first thing to acknowledge, <clears throat> and this is what I think climate hawks and NGOs don't acknowledge enough. The fossil fuel party has been the best party in history, in mankind's history. Fossil fuels are how we dragged ourselves out of the muck and into the 21st century. The amount of energy we consume, I, everyone's got their favorite stat. So I was in the, at the gym the other day and I noticed you know, the output of a fairly healthy human being the amount of energy you can capture from that output is about, it's worth about two cents an hour. You can go out about 200 watts or so if you're fairly fit, keep it up for an hour. That's about two cents worth of electrical energy. Right? So fossil fuels is what allows us to have the life that we have in the 21st century. It's the biggest machine we've ever built. This is the single largest piece of infrastructure mankind has ever built. We spend five trillion dollars a year on fossil fuels. It ain't going anywhere soon. This is a big boat, but we need to begin turning it. I'm going to tell you how we do that. And the reason we have to turn it is like all good parties, <laughs> this is going to be a hell of a hangover, right? The International Energy Agency, one of the most conservative groups on the planet, set up, as you know, to, to talk about Western oil energy security, has no reason to exaggerate climate. If anything, they have a disincentive to talk about the effects of climate. They came out of the closet in 2011. They have confirmed business as usual takes us to six degrees. No pixel makes a picture, but as more and more extreme weather events begin to happen, we see what is coming. You saw it in Calgary last year. We saw it in Toronto. We see it in Australia. We see it in the Philippines. We see it in California, longest drought in living memory, the breadbasket of America, the Central Valley in California. There's no water there. Think of climate change. Think of, of, of heat, that's six degrees, not as temperature. Think of it as energy. Because it's not just about temperature, it's about extreme weather changing rainfall patterns and so on. We are adding, and I kid you not, we are adding the energy equivalent of 400,000 Hiroshima bombs into the atmosphere every day. That's how much energy the additional carbon dioxide is capturing. That is an awful lot of energy built up over the next 20 or 30 years to wreak havoc on our cities, on our farms, on our coasts. So it is not about temperature, it is about energy. So here's the bad math. Here's why energy incumbents need to think hard if you're going to be an energy incumbent 20 years from now. We have 2,600 gigatons of carbon dioxide in our proven reserves sitting on the balance sheets of our fossil fuel companies. Right? The market is telling us we're going to burn this. The shares of the companies who own these reserves are priced, net present value, discounted, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know how it works. The market is telling us we're going to burn this stuff. This is how much we can burn if we're going to stay under two degrees. In 15 years, we will have burned all of that. Which means if we're staying under two degrees on year 16, zero emissions. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So this carbon budget is very tight. We are not going to keep within two degrees, I don't think personally. All hands on deck, maybe we will. But it looks bleak. We're trying to stop at two and a half, maybe three. The recent IPCC report talks about adaptation. It certainly does. And many in the press have hopped on that word and said, see, we can adapt. The IPCC talks about adapting to a world that is two, two and a half degrees warmer. 
to, to have that world to adapt to, we have to stick within this budget. No one's talking about adapting to five degrees. Nobody. So we have to leave 80% of our proven reserves in the ground. Now whether it's 80% or 70% or 60%, I don't care. If I'm an energy incumbent and I'm spending cash flow to explore for new reserves, 100% of those incremental reserves are unburnable. Because you can't even burn what you got. I don't care if it's a half or three quarters. Incremental reserves are unburnable. So my argument is, instead of spending money exploring and defining new reserves, that money would be better spent exploring and defining a new kind of reserve. We can argue about how we leave that in the ground later. The low-hanging fruit, the obvious fiduciary obligation of an energy incumbent is to stop spending investors' money discovering new reserves. It's a bad deal for the investor. It's 100% un unburnable. <clears throat> so there is a risk. It's called carbon risk. These are stranded assets. How much will be stranded? I don't know. This is going to be the fight of the, of, the, of the century. NGOs, economists, pension funds, climate hawks. We're going to fight like hell over this. How much will we leave in the ground? I don't know. I hope a lot. You know, <laughs> because it's getting warm. Anyway, the good math is this. The markets are changing. The pace and price of clean tech. Clean tech's all grown up, is the point I'm trying to make here. This is not your solar panel of 1970. This is not your biofuel plant of 1992. This generation of clean tech assets are significantly interesting to you. If you look at solar, this is the classic example. Look at the price of solar coming down. It will come down even more. I'll give you an example. It is approaching grid parity in most of the world. So much solar is going up on so many rooftops right now in the United States that incumbents, utilities, are seeing their very business model under threat. They're losing their customers. As the, utility, as the electric utility, so too, I argue, the oil and gas. These things happen very quickly. They're in the corner of your eye for a while, suddenly they're, in the, they're right there. That's the nature of exponential growth. That's what's happened to energy markets. And if you think we're not going to electrify transport, you're wrong. We will electrify transport. Elon Musk is single-handedly schooled Detroit on how to build a new car. Solar City has single-handedly threatened utilities in most of the United States. That's Elon Musk. He's now building a $3 billion lithium battery factory. So now you have the Tesla, which is coming down in price. You have massive drop in prices of batteries. And you have a massive distributed solar network. That sounds like a highly disruptive energy system to me. It's happening right now. And there will be investor pressure. Pension funds are asking about carbon risk, and you can have Exxon's response and say, I acknowledge the risk, but I will ignore you because the social license for me to sell it will not go away. Maybe. Maybe. I'd hedge my bet. We live in a democracy. People are getting scared. There will be policy. The ballot box will bring it. We've escaped it in this country for a long time because we have a first-past-the-post system and a very sympathetic prime minister. The world will move forward. So these are all reasons I'm saying to at least hedge your bets, <laughs> at least dabble. And when energy incumbents dabble, it rains gold on a little guy like me, right? They put the venture fund, $30 million venture fund. So my argument is this, if you dabble in these low carbon assets, you'll find I'm right about the claims I'm about to make. And that'll make you want to do more than, than dabble. So I'm going to now talk about these in some detail. One is woodland biofuels. They make uh, cellulosic ethanol, so ethanol from wood chips cheaper than gasoline. Hydrostore is the world's lowest cost energy storage grid scale that combined with wind can beat diesel. And Morgan Solar is coming into the market this year with the lowest cost solar energy on the planet. Incumbents are playing. Enbridge has invested in Morgan Solar, for example. And I'll talk about how one views that investment. I'm going to make it really easy for you to, to compare what we're doing on our side of the fence to what you're doing, and then you can make a decision. This is an operating demonstration plant in Sarnia. It works. We are producing ethanol from wood chips. Uh, a whole lot of diligence has been done on these guys. Weyerhaeuser and Chevron are their uh, offtake and intake partners for nine projects in the United States. There's two billion dollars of enterprise value that's been defined in a series of our first nine projects, which have locations, which have intake fiber agreements and so on. This plant has wrung out the technology risk. It works. Here's what it looks like comparing it with a traditional field. Now, I've just taken a guess on the numbers for a traditional field, but I'll, I'll show you something more precise in a moment. So when you develop a new field, you spend some money. You drill some holes, you do some seismic work, you hire some engineers. These are exploratory costs to define the risk and define the resource. 
Well, that's what an equity investment looks like in Woodland, right? It allows you to sit on the board and define the risk and look at the resource so you understand it, right? It's exploratory money. Here's where it gets really interesting. Our CapEx is about the same. If you look at $2 billion of enterprise value, you get about the equivalent CapEx per barrel of oil equivalent. The IRR is better for Woodland. Okay, fine. Here's the really interesting part, though. The risk profile is very different. The regulatory risk for an oil and gas field is high. We are entering a period of carbon constraints. That's a fact. I take that as a, as a, as a starting point. So the regulatory risk on traditional assets is high. On Morgan, or sorry, on Woodland, it's medium. Ethanol is a regulated market, but corn ethanol, which is a highly subsidized product, cannot compete with cellulosic ethanol from a Woodland plant or an Abignoa plant. There are other opportunities. Woodland's the one I know best. So the regulatory risk is quite low, because all we need to do is displace the corn-based ethanol, which has a fairly significant market. It's between you know, 7 or 8% of North American gas consumption. It's a big market. The reserve risk is very low. So, you know, when you do a seismic mapping of a field, you know what's under the, under, the, under the ground. There's some risk. You don't always know it precisely. You have geophysical risk, which engineers can refine. The, re the reserve risk on a woodland plant is tiny because it's a partner offtake risk. If you have a contract with Weyerhaeuser to provide you with wood chips for 20 years, your reserve risk is your offtake part, or your intake, your, is, your, um, is, your, is your intake partner risk. It's like a credit risk on a contract. It's very low. You just pick the right partner. Price sensitivity is low because Woodland competes on the retail cost rather than the, the wholesale cost of a barrel, which fluctuates as a percentage much more. The technical risk is tiny. They are both low, so they're about equal here. But the, Woodland's been proven. It's producing ethanol. Amec, this big engineering firm, is drawing up FEL3 diagrams right now for their commercial plant. The risk is very low. We've squeezed the risk out. That's our job as a venture community is to deliver, on a silver platter, a de-risked opportunity. That's why the risk is very low. The carbon risk is, of course, negative. If carbon gets regulated, ethanol looks even better. It's a carbon-neutral source of fuel. And even better is the upside. If you invest 10 or 20 million to develop a field, or to explore a field, then you put the capital in to develop it, there's no real upside outside of that field. With a clean asset, it's new technology where there is intellectual property. So the upside is enormous. So you, one might invest with a $2 billion enterprise value in mind, want to explore that, provide some capital, build that out. You now own the IP globally. So there's far higher upside. So these are all sort of very, you know, arm-waving kind of numbers, at least on the traditional field. I don't know what traditional fields look like. I've taken a guess after Googling some numbers. Here's something from Andrew Leach, and I hope I don't misquote Andrew. Very smart guy. This is from an article he wrote in McLean's, where he talks about what carbon risk really looks like to an oil sands play. One of the arguments, of course, that is made is that only 20% of the emissions comes from the production of the oil. 80% is on out the tailpipe. What that means is 80% of the carbon risk is outside the jurisdiction over which you have influence. <laughs> right? It's in California. It's in Europe. So Andrew did a quick sensitivity analysis on what is the IRR of an oil sands field, which is, starts out at an even lower rate of return than a, than a traditional field. And what happens when you have a, a carbon price increasing from your own 20% and from the downstream 20% as you face a, a lower cost in the market as your consumers absorb that? And the, the IRR disappears pretty quickly, right? Woodlands, the IRR will go up as the carbon risk increases. All I'm saying is this, hedge your bets. This is a way to hedge your bet on carbon risk. There are others. So Morgan Solar. It's a wonderful picture of a, of a solar field of advanced next generation solar where it's concentrated solar. So you take a, a whole lot of, of sunlight, you put it through a, a very thin optic, the IP is in the mass of that optic, drop it onto a very small, very efficient chip. You can produce solar power for five cents a kilowatt hour. They'll be in the market this year. Enbridge has invested in Morgan. I believe the reason Enbridge invested in Morgan is because they want a front row seat into projects that have that kind of an IRR. Morgan will be building their, their commercial projects this year. Level S cost of energy, five cents a kilowatt hour in high DNI areas. That's the rate of return on a Morgan project. Enbridge invested in hydrogenics. Hydrogenics stock is up to hydrogen play. Their stock is up six to seven times since they invested. Enbridge is dabbling. And by dabbling, they're finding out, they're digging around, and they're finding out what, uh, what 
interesting reserves there are here in these low carbon assets. Hydrostore, this is underwater compressed air energy storage. It, so basically you take a giant bag, it's not really a bag, it's called an accumulator, drop it in the bottom of the ocean, and when you want to store energy, you run a giant compressor and you, filled it with, you fill it with air. And you want the energy back, you run it in reverse, put it through an expander. You have some heat exchange to make it more efficient, it's about two-thirds efficient. We're building a commercial project right now for Toronto Hydro, where they will demonstrate it is more economic to store power all night long in a downtown core and then release it during the day, more economic than building a natural gas peaking plant. We're building a commercial project in Aruba where they will store wind power all night long and release it all day long. Wind developers are really interested in Hydrostore because a wind developer who incorporates Hydrostore can bid open market power purchase agreements against diesel pretty much anywhere in the world and beat diesel hands down. So now you have clean, dispatchable, renewable energy. Our market now is the Caribbean, so we're going after diesel first. This is no economies of scale. This is just coming out of the gate. We're a startup. And we're capable of disrupting an entire region's energy supply, which is diesel. We will take that market. And we will take that market because we're better and faster and cheaper than diesel. And we have far less price risk going forward. We can sign 25-year power purchase agreements at 18, 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Diesel suppliers cannot do that. Today diesel, tomorrow coal. Tomorrow coal, the next day natural gas. This is coming. There are many others. There are some wild cards like General Fusion down in Vancouver. This is kind of an all or nothing play. Deep technology risk. This takes big, patient, strategic money. Uh, it's interesting. I hope it works. My interest is in enhanced geothermal. So enhanced geothermal, I think we know what it is here. You drill down deep enough anywhere on the planet, you get the hot, dry rock. Fracture that rock. It's 300 degrees down there. Fracture that rock, just like we fracture for nat gas, but you're fracturing to create a loop. Put down fluid, suck out heat. Take out one degree of heat from one cubic kilometer of rock. It's 300 degree rock, right? Say so one degree of it, one cubic kilometer, and then you get the energy equivalent of 70,000 tons of coal. There's an operating plant in Australia. There's an operating plant in France. This is by no means a, a done deal. There's a lot of technology risk here. Only big patient money can go after this. The challenge is that this doesn't have intellectual property. So it's hard to ask energy incumbents to step up and play here because they're, well, what's my first mover advantage? On Woodland, I had IP. Hydrostore, I have intellectual property. So why would, I, why, would I, why would I do this? I'll take all the risk. Everybody else benefits. And it's absolutely true. There's a first mover disadvantage for that kind of technology. We know how to do something in this country. It's drill and frack, right? Well, what came out of an energy conference at the Perimeter Institute in Ontario two years ago was the following suggestion. This was suggested by the chief scientist of Australia, who's a mining guy who knows how to drill and frack rock. Ten projects at a total cost of a billion dollars, public-private partnership, just like COSIA shares best practices, shares intellectual property, that's what this consortium would do. And you do 10 projects around the world that cost of $100 million each. You learn how to frack that rock efficiently. You learn how to take the heat out efficiently. You learn how to get flow rates efficiently. You learn how much you can, you can get sacked, take out of a, a piece of rock and how long it will replenish itself. It's a renewable resource at the end of the day. And if you do that, the belief is you will open up the private markets for enhanced, enhanced geothermal, there's 30,000 times our primary energy needs sitting beneath our feet in North America. Not on a theoretical number. This is assuming 30% conversion, only take 10 degrees of that 300 degrees, don't drill near cities, don't drill in national parks. This is the real deal. There's far more energy down there in the form of heat than you'll ever get from oil sands or coal or natural gas. Far more. And it lasts a long, long time. <laughs> so enhanced geothermal, in my mind, is kind of the holy grail of clean energy. And so the suggestion of a consortium to, to, to look at this internationally, I think, is an interesting one. There is another one with carbon sequestration. All hands on deck, I say. Right? We, will need these, we will need all of these opportunities 10, 15 years from now when we start to get really scared. Right? So it's, it's important to develop these big projects. Carbon sequestration is one of them. I think it's a deep challenge. So I applaud the winners. I wish them, I wish them luck. I hope they succeed. The two challenges I would note here are, one, it's a low, carb, it's a low energy molecule. That's why it's the output of combustion. 
And so you have to somehow react it with something. And there's enzymes and ideas, and I look forward to, to hearing about those ideas. I mean, if you make algae, you have to input light to make the algae, right? So it takes energy to convert that molecule. The other is simply mass flow. As Vaclav Shmil has pointed out, if you took one quarter of the stationary sources of carbon dioxide in North America, and you wanted to like wrap it up and sequester it, the mass flow that you would handle is equivalent to the entire world's oil supply. That's how much mass flow you have, because it's carbon dioxide. You've added two oxygens to the carbon. It's a lot of weight. It's a lot of mass. All hands on deck, I say. So I look forward to hearing about those. So if these are all such a great deal, Tom, why isn't this just happening? Can't we just rely on the market to, to do this? Well, the problem is, particularly when it comes to climate, it is really difficult to understand and really believe how bad this is. If you go into the carbon kitchen, you don't come out the same. <laughs> you have sleepless nights and so on. Understanding how bad that problem is, for a, from a business perspective, means there's going to be some big rewards, right? So of course it's sort of a horrible thing. But that's what drives my fundamental proposition to you. The energy markets will change. You can either be ahead of the parade or watching it. They will change. The reason I believe they will change is because I understand climate. It takes a, a lot of effort. I don't mean intellectual effort. I mean emotional effort to understand climate. Because our unconscious thinking, which is where most of our decisions are made, doesn't want to let climate in. I'll tell you why. So the way we think, and there's some details about this in the book, is we make associations all our lives between one thing and another. Mom, lovely. Tiger, scary. Zoo, fun. And we form, literally we form connections between ideas all our lives. That's what a neural network does. That's how our brains operate. These are physically instantiated associations. We do it all our lives. As we become adults, these associations become more complex. They form our worldview. They form our common sense. You can't teach common sense to a computer for that reason. We humans are able to disambiguate meaning in a highly complex world in a heartbeat. That's what makes us uniquely human. We are not Spock. We are not rational. We are neural networks, and most of our thinking is under the radar. So people make distinctions, fast thinking, slow thinking, that's Dan Kahneman, implicit, explicit, conscious, unconscious. It's all roughly the same thing. Most of our thinking is unconscious, it is automatic, it is very fast, and it is associationist. You don't will it. You don't decide what ideas are associated with each other. It just happens. So as we become adults, our common sense, our set of become, become worldviews. It's how we make sense of the world. It's how we're able to operate in the world. And climate change, six degrees of warming, total disruption of our economic system runs counter to most of our deeply held beliefs. And when a new belief comes in and it runs counter to a bunch of other beliefs, the new belief gets bumped out. That's why it's literally hard to believe it's this bad. Denial is not just saying it's not true. Educated people don't do that anymore. But all of us, me included, this is not a judgment, this is an empirical observation of what it is to be a human being, all of us act as if it weren't true, or act as if it weren't that bad. We have to. We have kids to get to hockey, we got jobs, like, it's, I want to worry about them riot in the streets over climate, come on. But it, it bumps up against a lot of things we hold dear, like human ingenuity knows no bounds. Very Western notion, right? We can solve any problem that comes our way, we've done it in the past. The future is better than the past. This is what every parent hands to their kid. The world will be better for you. Climate disruption runs completely counter to that belief. Someone somewhere will take care of it. Ever since we were kids, someone's taken care of something. Right? We haven't, I personally, most of us haven't lived through a war, a real war. Someone somewhere will take care of it. This happens to us. This is a deeply held belief. Hubris, ever since Sir Francis Bacon talked about our brains and our opposable thumbs, nature has been ours to command. And we have good reason for thinking that. Look at life in the 21st century. We do have command over nature by all indications. We grow food. This is wonderful. I flew here from Toronto. Life is grand. The challenge is we may have just enough intelligence to knock over the apple cart, but not enough to pick it back up again. Right? Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. They couldn't put them back together again. So our hubris, our belief that we can solve this, climate change runs counter to that. We have to be a little more humble. 
right? It's nature that's ultimately in charge, not us. That's a humiliating thing for a Western grown-up to understand, for most of us. The one that's most relevant, I think, the most immediate, is steady hand at the tiller, right? Not just you know, mess with your social and political constructs radically at your peril. This has held us in very, this is small C conservatism, has held us in very good stead for a long time. It is good advice, steady hand at the tiller. If you run infrastructure, if you run a fossil fuel company, if you run a utility, steady hand at the tiller. You don't take technology risk, right? There's the last thing you do as someone who runs infrastructure. Challenges, of course, that the steady hand of the tiller will take us right off the climate cliff. So these deeply held beliefs, which are often implicit, they're just part of what makes us up, runs counter to climate. That's why when we talk about climate, people get so angry. People get really angry when you talk about climate. It's like religion, right? Because it causes cognitive dissonance. When these beliefs bumped up against each other, it causes friction, it causes bad emotions. Now whether we think this, we think this is all kind of too academic, I'm going to quickly finish here. This is not academic, this is not a theory. There are very well known, very well measured, empirically measured cognitive biases, right? The first thing our brain will do, our unconscious brain, is avoid effort. Like every physical system, it avoids energy. And emotions are a big part of the energy of our system. I'm speaking sort of metaphorically, but not really. So when someone asks you about climate disruption, so I'm talking about six degrees, the first thing your brain will do unconsciously is say, that's a complicated question, there are many views about that, it runs counter to most of the things, I don't like the way it makes me feel, I don't really understand it. Your brain will answer a different question, which is how do you feel about climate disruption in six degrees? I don't feel very good about it. So your, your default value, all of us, is I don't believe it. It can't be that bad. That's our default position as human beings, everybody. We then have confirmation bias. So we then seek evidence that confirms that belief. And there is lots of evidence in lots of places that will confirm the don't worry, be happy attitude. Doesn't make it right, but we, we, we seek that evidence out and ignore evidence to the contrary. This is measured. We do this every day. It's called confirmation bias. The next is the affect heuristic. So you, you default to not believing it. You seek evidence that confirms that belief. Someone then tries to argue out of it. Say, ah, here's, it's happened. Here's all my evidence. If you don't like the conclusion of an argument, you won't believe the argument. We're not rational creatures. We were not. So the affect heuristic means that anybody who tries now to argue against that, which we've been doing for 20 years, doesn't really get a fair hearing. And then peer group bias. We value the opinions of our peers more than we value the opinions of experts. And, our, and if you're surrounded by peers who say, I don't really believe it. I seek evidence to confirm that belief. I don't like the arguments that tell me otherwise and everyone's thinking the same way, that's groupthink. That's, that's pure group bias. So there are an there's an enormous set of psychological forces that act against us from taking this seriously. So it isn't just a case of me saying to you, hey, I got a great deal for you. <laughs> we go about our business every day as if the energy markets were not going to change, as if this was not as bad as I'm saying it is. The IPCC is saying it is. The International Energy Agency is saying it is. We're human beings, right? All of us. That's one of the barriers to collaboration. So we need new stories of possibility and collaboration. So there are ways to get around these, these barriers. I've got some details in the book. These barriers can actually work in our favor if we, if we have the right message and we talk about it in the right way. The last is this. I know that every company just has to make money. It's like the, the robot in iRobot has a prime directive, never contravene the prime directive. No energy company in their right minds, and no, no corporate in their right minds, will voluntarily forgo profit. We'll nibble around the edges. It's called greenwashing in, 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 the, in the climate space. I get it, right? Fiduciary obligation always trumps personal conscience. That's just the way it is. It's like, Tom, yeah, you're right. I, I, I hear you. I feel you. But I operate in an environment that is very pragmatic. I can't just change what's happening. Well, here's the opening. I've explained to you, and you know what carbon risk is. I've explained to you and given you some examples of disruptive technology that will change your markets. All I'm saying, all I'm really asking is this. There is a gap, there is a door open. I would argue there is a fiduciary obligation for the energy incumbents to hedge their bets, to dabble, seriously dabble, 
in clean energy assets. The door's open. If I'm a board member of an energy incumbent, someone says to the CEO says to me, I think we need to look at some clean energy assets. I'd say, why? They'd say, carbon risk, changing markets, changing policy environments, yada, yada, yada. And it's a pretty good deal. The door is open for an energy incumbent to become an energy incumbent of the future, i.e. one who embraces a low carbon footprint. Not of their own operations, but of the energy they sell. So the door is open. You all remember Apollo 13, right? These are astronauts are out in space, and the oxygen tank blew up, and the world watched in bated breath and horror while they tried to fix it. And central control on Earth gave them advice, but they were on their own. Bubble gum and duct tape, they pulled it off, they came back to Earth, and everyone was relieved. This is our Apollo. Someone is playing with the airlock. We know this now. We know we have 10 or 20 years to stop that from happening. We don't have a mothership. We sit in the 21st century with more capital available to us than humankind has ever seen. More ingenuity than the world has ever seen. More engineers, more talent, the ability to produce advanced materials at unprecedented rates. More industrial capacity than we've ever seen, than we ever had. A fraction of that capacity needs to be turned towards solving this problem. And the groups who have most access to that machinery and the most ability to run that machinery are the energy incumbents. We cannot solve this problem without you. I've extended my hand to you. Everyone in the clean tech sector is extending their hand to you. We need your help, but I would also argue you need ours. Thank you very much. You made a strong case for the energy incumbents to, to get into right. this sector, the clean, the clean tech sector. Uh, anyone who's done any work on the productivity space in Canada says one of the problems is that we have a weak venture capital sector, period. Right. We saw Exxon's response to climate change. You mentioned that. We have the social license to continue. I mean, it's a hard conclusion for a lot of people who are in a very successful business to divert funds into an area that is speculative. Yeah. Is there anything that can be done to strengthen the venture capital sector in Canada that isn't being done that you'd like to see be done? Yeah, I mean, I, I, venture capital in Canada is, is starved compared to our American counterparts. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the big complaints in the venture community is that when Canadian companies get to a certain size and a certain stature, they're gobbled up by Americans and they go south of the border. I don't know how you legislate. I mean, the federal government's pouring a lot of money into, into venture capital right now. The challenge I have with that, the model, so they've acknowledged the problem, but it's, it's, it doesn't embrace new entrants to the market. So it's the same funds that will do the same things. Um, I think, oh, so I think the energy, the, Synovus has a venture fund. Right. Synovus used to invest in stuff outside their fence. They would invest in low carbon technologies. They've reverted course and now they only invest in technologies that reduce their own emissions. So I think the solution is to have the energy incumbents step up. It's not regulation, it's not the federal government. Have the energy incumbents step up and take seriously the strategy of saying, let's put a half a percent of our cash flows into a green fund, greenfield fund, that is developing and investigating and exploring these low carbon assets. You gave us a, a tour of the landscape at a very, very high level. Uh, talk to me just about your clean tech fund. You've got $30 right. million. Dollars. What do you do with it? What kind of projects are you looking right. at? Right, so we have. And, and yeah. sorry, and what, you talked about collaboration. What would the energy incumbents do yeah, with you? Really good question. So we're, we're a small fund, 30 million. It's all private money. We have a $20 million annex fund, which does follow on investing in, in some of our companies. So we do have some follow on uh, firepower. We've got eight companies. Um, uh, you saw two of them, which is Hydrostore and Woodland. That you're already invested that in. That we're invested in. So our role is to go in early. We take a board seat. We take the technology risk out. We build the management team. So you've got a significantly interesting company with significantly interesting technology. We then would go to the market and say, hey, Suncor or Synovus or Transalta or, or whoever, whoever Chrysalix, uh, co-invest with us in the next round. You lead it, you tell me what the company's worth, we'll follow you. So our role is to seed the prime the pump, but we need partners. It's a collaborative exercise for us no matter what, because clean tech is capital intensive. You, you set out very, very precisely the major conundrum. I mean, you can marshal the case that there are great investment opportunities in all alternative sources, and that it's wise financially to do that. Right. But nothing much is happening because of the dissonance. 
well, talked about. Yeah. What what has to what has to give yeah. for for those two things to stop colliding? So there was interest in clean tech eight nine years ago, right? Silicon Valley got into clean tech pretty heavy. Vinod Kosla, Kleiner Perkins, the big funds in Silicon Valley got into clean tech. Um, I think what happened was they mistook clean tech for IT, right? And they treated it as if it was IT. And an enormous amount of equity was going into projects that had a lot of technology risk. I mean, I love Vinod Kosla. I think he's a, a, a brave man, a smart man, but he's had three really big blow-ups in the biofuel space. And it's, he's done more to kill the biofuel sector than anybody I know, because people look at range fuels and Cascada and Kior and say, not for me, thanks. Um, so the, the, that's why I think incumbents, so whether it's GE or Siemens or, or the oil and gas guys, um, bring an awareness of what's involved in those kinds of projects. And I don't think, I think you would scale up your technology risk very differently with a strategic partner than you would if you were just coming blind out of Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley blew up, right? They had a bad experience on clean tech. It's a bad word down there now. Now you say you're advanced energy or smart grid or something and they'll listen to you. But I think that's poisoned the well. Uh, so as a contrarian, I'm fine with that because, you know, it's a contrarian thesis, which means there's not a lot of competition for investment. Um, and I think the people who are at the table are the OEMs, GE, Siemens, 3M. These companies take very seriously the long-term view as to what they're going to be selling 10 or 20 years from now. Those are our best. When we have deals, those are who we go to for, for, for investment partnerships. Your basic message is in a low carbon future, there's tremendous opportunities. There's opportunities for investment, there's opportunities to avoid the traps that people who, uh, you know, ignore this. You often hear from the environmentalists, both of us have worked with the environmental movement in a number of instances, that, you know, a low carbon future means all bad stuff. <laughs> you know, drive a bicycle and right. live in, in, right. in, a, in a cave. Right. Do you do any work with the environmental movement? Do you see it changing and starting to shift its gears more towards the opportunity side of the equation? They have to, I think, to remain relevant, right? I mean, this is one of the, the messages I have around how the brain works, right? If all you do is tell bad news stories about wearing sweaters and shivering in the dark, <laughs> uh, you, people will ignore you. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's absolutely crucial that the story becomes one of abundant future, economic stimulus, clean. I mean, there's a, there's a positive vision there that I think some, that many are beginning to embrace, right? And, and many are also now beginning to embrace the idea of collaboration, right? That, that is, us and them doesn't work anymore. Um, and so some are, some aren't. I won't name names, but uh, I think that's absolutely crucial in any NGO's evolution is to understand that the incumbents aren't bad people. Right? And they powered our civilization, for God's sake. Uh, you know, we just have to find a way to, 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 to find another path together. You mentioned over the course of your marks uh, a carbon tax. And there are many people in the policy field who believe that you know, until we monetize carbon, we're never really going to deal with uh, this issue. There's more and more in industry who are prepared to uh, uh, go down that path as well. Ever since Stefan Dion advanced this as a possibility, it has been deemed politically toxic. No one right. wants to touch this. Yeah. Uh, given that kind of paralysis yeah. at the political level, how do you break that log, Jim? Well, Canada 2020, um, this is um, um, Mark Carney's, I, should, I can't remember her name, Mark Carney's wife. Right. I should, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name. Um, runs Canada 2020, thank you. Um, and the, they did a lot of polling. And there is a majority of Canadians from every party that wants a carbon tax. And the amount of people that want a carbon tax, it actually goes up when you, when you identify a price on it. So it's, it's a known quantity. So the, the political paralysis we have is not about whether or not a carbon tax is a palatable political option. It is. The polls say it is. What you, for, we have two problems. One is, I love Stefan Dion, but he, was, he wasn't, uh, wasn't going to sell it to anybody, right? Uh, you know, I'm a geek. I love fellow geeks. I love them. But he, he, wasn't, artic he wasn't the champion, no. right? So you need a champion who can, who can paint a picture that's compelling. And I think you also need to sort of, and I think you need to motivate the incumbents in Ottawa to say, you know, you can use that as a differentiator if you want for your base, but a plurality of your own constituents are asking for this. And I think that's the way in. And, and there isn't really a downside for the conservatives to, to embrace it. Their own constituents are asking for it. First past the post makes it tough, because, you know, but... The, um... Conference sponsors have really reached out to the student community. Um, before you, you had your remarks, we were talking uh, over there that you did a presentation the other day and that younger executives yeah. really get this. Yeah. Uh, talk to the audience about hiring that generation and what different dynamic that could create in their corporate culture. 
Well, I would argue it's already there, right? So, I, you know, I gave a talk to a, a World Oil Congress, Youth Congress. By youth, it was, you know, 25 to 40, right? So these are up-and-coming executives. Their starting point is they get it. Just like I can see when I was talking, many people here get it. I can tell by the look on your faces. Um, the, you know, the challenge they have is to say, look, I'm, I'm in a system. Like, I, I, my hands are not yet on the levers of power, right? I am not the CEO. I am not the pension fund guy who writes the check. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a soldier. Uh, how, what, do, what am I supposed to do? And, the, and there's a the sense of frustration that they're articulate, scientifically minded engineers, smart people. They get it. They're, I think the frustration is, everyone's frustration, how do you act within the constraints of fiduciary obligation, short-term profit, and so on? It's a fundamental problem. But I think in terms of, of, of who's coming, I think you can, you can count on support. <laughs> if, you were, if you have your hands on the, on, on the levers, I think you can count on the support of your employees if you articulated that kind of a vision for sure. I would also argue if your hands are on the levers of power, then, then presumably you're doing okay in your life. It's time to step up and be the hero of this story. It doesn't matter who the hero is. It matters we get the job done. And there is an opportunity for you know, the, the, the big leaders in our oil and gas sector to step up and be a hero.